Welcome to ZCast, everyone. I'm Zia Scaraval from ZK Research, and I'm here at the AWS stand inside the massive expo hall at NVIDIA's GTC 2025 in San Jose. I'm with Shruti Kopakar uh, from AWS. Uh, Shruti, how you doing? I'm good, and welcome to our booth. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, and what, what's your role at AWS? Yeah, so I lead product marketing for accelerated computing at AWS, and so it's all of our AI compute that is accelerated with NVIDIA GPUs, our own AI chips, as well as several other things in the portfolio. That's a lot in the portfolio. Yeah, we yeah. have a broad portfolio. And, and growing. And growing, yeah, we believe in choice and giving customers the flexibility to choose what they need uh, to achieve the price performance, to achieve the, um, you know, performance goals, uh, time to market goals. Yeah. yeah. And so I want to talk about, obviously about the AWS NVIDIA partnership. Before we do that, though, um, you obviously talk to a lot of customers. Yeah. Where are we with AI? What's going on? Where are customers' heads at? Are they excited about it? You know? Yeah, no, I think the, I think the excitement hasn't died down, yeah. right? Like, for, it started back a couple of years ago, yeah. and I it's kept up. if you look at the 27,000 people here, that would tell you that, right? That's yeah. right, yeah. exactly. I think I think it speaks for itself. Uh, we definitely see the whole spectrum. Um, there are customers who were doing pilots, um, you know, last year, a little bit earlier than that, who have very much moved to full full scale production um, and seeing the benefits of generative AI in action. Um, there are others who are now starting to experiment with it and running these small pilots to hopefully then scale into production. Um, there are also customers who sometimes struggle to identify, like they want to do things with AI, but they sure don't, but they're not sure where. Um, and I think the big thing there really is about leaning into your domain expertise and your domain data. Like leave the technology out of it first, right? Like people such as AWS and NVIDIA can help you with that, but lean into what you know about your customers and your, your domain, and first really figure out what is the use case you want to start with. Um, and so, yeah, that, I think customers are kind of across that entire spectrum, but the enthusiasm for AI has not died down, um, and we are seeing real-world impact. Um, and ultimately, you know, honestly, the customers who figure out how to unlock this AI advantage are the ones who will kind of come ahead. Yes, yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, it was no so different than the cloud. Those that figured out the cloud advantage got a big Exactly, yeah, so, exactly. Yeah. Now, um, specifically to uh, NVIDIA, AWS and NVIDIA have been partners for a long time. In fact, I think before it was cool to partner with NVIDIA, you were. Uh, in fact, I believe I read somewhere that there's more NVIDIA workloads running in AWS than all of the cloud providers combined. So. Um, wow, I have not read that stat. <laughs> yeah. If it if it is true, it is yeah. true. Uh, it is awesome. It's pretty close, if not. But yeah, yeah. but, but uh, there obviously Nvidia has partnerships with all the cloud providers. So what makes AWS and Nvidia unique? Yeah, I mean you are absolutely right. We've been partnering with Nvidia for over 14 years, and I never get tired of saying this. We were the first to bring a GPU in the cloud, and so starting there, we've really grown it to be um, offer uh, the widest range of accelerated, GPU accelerated computing solutions. Um, and it has been a really deep partnership co-engineering solutions together with NVIDIA that goes past just the GPU bit. You know, the GPU of course is central to um, accelerating workloads, but there's so much more that goes around it, and we work very closely with NVIDIA on that. Um, and some examples of that, for example, are we, you know, we have SageMaker Hyperpod, which yeah. is a uh, which is an Amazon service that allows you uh, to train models um, on a resilient cluster. And we've integrated, we've announced an integration last year, just late last year, with Run AI, which is now part right. of NVIDIA, um, to help sort of um, schedule with the job scheduling and so on and so forth when it comes to training jobs. Um, so that's one example. The other is you've heard a lot from NVIDIA about NVIDIA NIMS. Yes, and yes, yes. Uh, these are you know package containers that come with the optimization with the libraries, with all the models, uh, but when you need to scale it, you are running it typically on something like an Amazon EKS, um, which is our managed service for Kubernetes. And so that, that integration is working out really well and delivering value for customers. So it really is deep co-engineering across all the layers from infrastructure, like taking the GPUs and integrating them into our AWS Nitro yeah. system, which um, makes it inherently more stable, reliable, secure, and performant, 
um, to all the way up the stack. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's it's also you know the, the, what's unique about it is is the success that our customers have seen with with these combined solutions. Yeah, well, both, <clears throat> both companies are very customer centric. I think um, <clears throat> you know not everybody's going to have the money to rack and stack a DGX or something like that, and so. Uh, you know, by leveraging it as a service, customers can actually get started with their AI projects immediately, right? And not worry too much about it. Yeah. Now, you had talked about customers moving from pilot to production. Yeah. Um, what are some of the challenges when they do that? And what's some, some advice to you? Yeah, no, great question. So, like I said, like some of the considerations when moving from pilot to production, like a big one for sure is security, privacy, governance, and all of that. Because like, Doing something in this small pilot uh, sort of a paradigm is much easier because you have to worry less about that. But when you are scaling across so many users, those things start to come in. And so whether it be you know things like guardrails inside Bedrock or just the inherent security of our infrastructure, AWS and NVIDIA offer solutions that can help you address that. Um, the other consideration, of course, is as I mentioned, the, the domain-specific data and, and expertise. Um, and we just um, launched SageMaker Unified Studio, which kind of brings all of your data and analytics together with AI um, and helps you kind of unlock your domain advantage um, in that in that. And then finally, I think cost is definitely a big concern. Yes, yes. When you are taking something to production, um, you know, of course there's upfront cost of building the systems, but then when you go from <laughs> hundreds of thousands to tens of millions of users, the inference costs start to scale. Um, and again, once again, you know, the optimizations that NVIDIA is delivering on inference, um, together with um, services like Amazon Bedrock, uh, which are helping customers cut costs, um, I think are enabling those sort of pilot to production uh, uh, transitions. Yeah, and actually one of the things I like about Bedrock, though, being multi-model, is that, um, I don't know if you saw this, but Cisco released a report uh, a few weeks ago talking about how none of the models themselves are all that secure. Yeah. And uh, and I started thinking about that. I'm not sure it's really up to a model provider to provide the security, but using Bedrock with guardrails built into it, now companies can pick and choose whatever model they want to use, and they know that the guardrails are going to be consistent, right? Exactly. Yeah. I mean, it's so seamless, and especially something like Bedrock is imp important when customers are figuring out their use cases, because it's hard to say what model will work for your use case. Yeah. And so to have an access to a service like Bedrock, Bedrock, where you can just switch between the models, try it out, figure out what works, uh, but your experience still remains consistently the same yeah. because it's all available through Bedrock. Yeah. Um, so yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Now, do you see customers using AI infrastructure to build the models directly, or do you see more serverless with inferencing, or what do you what do you see? Yeah, we are seeing a really great mix and like across the whole spectrum um, and it really comes down to the use case. Uh, one great example is uh, Adobe. So Adobe has invested in machine learning long before generative AI was even a word yeah. and so they obviously had all the expertise um, they needed to go in and do this themselves. Like they wanted better control of their infrastructure, they wanted to track utilization, they had a uh, Kubernetes um, orchestration already in place and they wanted to continue using that. And so that's when, you know, a solution like our GPU accelerated EC2 instances with EKS, Amazon EKS on top. Um, they also use Triton inference server. So they are a great example of people who want to use different infrastructure pieces and put it all together themselves. They want to build their own AI pipeline. On the other hand is a customer like Lonely Planet who has amazing domain expertise in like the travel sector. And for example, for one of their use cases, they wanted to uh, do content generation for itineraries and wanted to bring costs down. And so that's why they use Amazon Bedrock because that was, you know, it was easy, it was seamless. Um, and and they, it helped them reduce costs. And then finally, we also have customers who are on the middle of the spectrum, like Perplexity, who build their own models, so they want that hands-on infrastructure, uh, and they have the expertise too, you need to have that. Uh, uh, they want that hands-on experience with Infra, but for example, for their Perplexity API, they also wanted to provide their customers with access to other models, and so that's where Bedrock came in. Um, yeah. So it's kind of, it's a mix, and it really depends on your use case. We have customers who use 
infra for some pieces, but bedrock for the other, and and you know everything in between. No, that makes sense. Yeah, I, and it's really up to the customer to decide. Yeah. Now you had talked about the kind of complexity in navigating this world of models. Yeah. And so, what about domain-specific use cases? Um, yeah. Some models are really good at some things and not very good at others. And so, how do companies navigate? the way around for these specific domains. Yeah, no, such a such a great point. So in some cases, a very sort of general model might work well, but more often than not, we see that, you know, some amount of fine tuning or some amount of domain specificity really, really helps. Um, and so again, like one example of this is a company called Hippocratic AI, um, who, is, uh, who is a startup and we've been working with them, both NVIDIA and AWS, uh, with our Activate and Inception programs. And um, they are actually actually building AI-powered clinical assistance to help healthcare teams everywhere um, avoid burnouts. And they have built what they called uh, a constellation architecture, which is a system of over 20 specialized models. So imagine a model that is kind of focused on prescription adherence, another yeah. model focused that's on very, lab analysis. Very specific. Yeah. yeah, another model that's focused on like guidance about over-the-counter medication. And they have this giant constellation of you know multiple specialized specialized models uh, that then together give the assistance that patients need um, and help healthcare teams. So that's one example. Another slightly different example of domain specificity is language um, adaptation. So we have several customers in Japan. You know, a lot of the language models are in English. But uh, in Japan, they wanted something in Japanese. Yeah. And so they started with base models such as Llama from Meta. And then they introduced Japanese data and trained them. Um, and they actually used, we have several customers in Japan who use the AWS Trainium chips, which are our purpose-built yeah. AI chips, uh, because it is a huge price performance advantage when they're training, you know, pre-training from scratch. So that is another example of where fine-tuning um, or even pre-training uh, for some sort of specificity helps. Yeah. All right, Trudy, so last question. Uh, for those people watching out there, everyone's interested in AI. Yeah. Uh, just a couple of pieces of advice on how to get started. Yeah, I mean, you know, I will take what I have experienced personally in my AI journey and, and you know, kind of project that I think it works even for the customers, which is to start small and scale fast. Like start, start with small, something yeah, small yeah. and identify a small use case, get it down, try things out, make it work, and then from there, scale fast. Yeah. Um, and so, you know. I actually call that uh, chip shots, not moon shots. Right? right. So if you know, if you have this big moon shot project, you're just going to sit there and go, do I have nothing. no idea. Yeah. You but don't you, do but, know where to start. But if it's a yeah. little chip shot. You can do those, and then eventually that leads you to the moonshot. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's awesome. I love that. Yeah, all right. Uh, anything else you want to add? Yeah, I think that's that, that's all. Okay, okay. Uh, well, thanks, Shruti. I appreciate the time. Uh, so on behalf of uh, Shruti Kopakar from AWS, I'm Zias Karavala from ZK Research, saying thanks for watching. Uh, give us a like and hit that subscribe button. We'll see you next time on the next episode of ZCast. Thanks, Shruti. Thank you. Thank you.